My name's James Robinson. I'm the editor of a magazine called The Classic Motorcycle. Now, we deal with a lot of motor motorbikes very much like this, but this is actually my own. Um, this is a 1927 Sunbeam Model 6, 492cc long stroke. So Sunbeam were uh, one of the, the leading makers in the 1920s. Um, they had a lot of success, mainly racing and in, in long distance trials and things like that. But it was it was racing that they really made their name and a lot of it was established on the, on the machine that was really this model. Some being owned by the Marston family, John Marston, and built in a fantastic place called Sunbeam Land, a brilliant factory which still stands in Wolverhampton today. In 1920 the Isle of Man TT resumed having stopped for the First World War and the winners of the first race, the first senior race which is the 500cc class were Sunbeam with what was essentially this model so that's the 492cc long stroke side valve model. Um, a guy called Tommy De La Haye was the, ri the rider, he won the senior which at that point was quite probably the biggest the biggest race in the world. In 1922 a guy called Alec Bennett also won the senior TT again on a on a long stroke side valve sunbeam very much like this one. So by the time this bike was made in 1927 sunbeam had a really good reputation. They had started to to go away from these the side valves were getting replaced by overhead valves so we'll come into that in a little bit when we talk about the engine but so by 1924 the the long stroke side valve was starting to be replaced by the overhead valve job. Now, it didn't mean that the side valves were discounted or, dis or, or given up on. So some of them kept listing them and kept selling them and they were still ever so popular. So by the time this bike came out, although it was a side valve and now retrospectively side valves are looked upon as more the ride to work, very utilitarian type bikes, in the 1920s, a side valve wasn't necessarily that, and Sunbeam being the main example. So despite the fact that this was what would appear at a glance, a very kind of basic, for want of a better word, machine, it was actually regarded as quite a sporty bike. Sunbeam and Norton were probably the two leading exponents with the side valves, Norton 16H and, the, and this model, and they were really regarded as quite a sporty racing machine. So this is the, um, the Sunbeam engine, it's a 492cc side valve. Now it's meant, it's called a side valve simply because the valves are here on the side. The reason that, that companies like Sunbeam were doing it, and so were a lot of others at the time, was that because in the 1920s, early 1920s and earlier on than that as well really, there was a lot of problems with the metallurgy wasn't, wasn't great and so valves would break. And what would happen is that the valve stem would break just below the head and snap. So with a side valve, all that happens then is that the valve just drops out of the bottom. If you have an overhead valve engine, which becomes more popular, so that the valves are in the top, if the valve stem breaks, the valve head drops, drops in effectively, causing catastrophic damage, hence the popularity for a long time of side valves. Now riders would often, you know, they were also easy to change the valves on these, riders would often carry, carry spare valves and be able to just drop them in reasonably quickly. Now Harley Davidson kept racing side valve engines until the 1960s, early 1970s actually, and really did refine the concept. Because the problem with a side valve is that the combustion chamber shape has to be hugely compromised. So the piston is kind of behind the valve, so in there. And so you're having this, this sort of side where the valves are popping up into the cylinder head here. And then you've got this, the piston is behind, so it's compressing it not in an ideal way. You're not getting nice clean airflow. So it, it was a compromise, but it was always preferred simply because, because of this problem of valve breaking. In the UK particularly, by the end of the 1920s, most of the makers, if they were making sporty machines, had gone away from a side valve. The Sunbeam was probably the last what was regarded as a sporty side valve. But even then, the overhead valve models had come out in 1924, around about then. And by sort of 1927, 28, really side valves had become more sort of utilitarian, often sidecars and things like that. But 
they started off as quite a sporty, quite a sporty machine, and the Sunbeam being, being the, the sportiest of the lot. So we're going from right to left on the controls. Front brake, an inverted lever there, but that's the front, the front brake. Then here we've got the throttle, which is a lever. So pull towards you to accelerate. It's the same principle as if you had a twist grip, you'd be twisting it. On the lever, you pull it towards you to open the throttle. This is the air lever, which is effectively the same as a choke, really. That's the, the way to explain it. You tend to run, if it's cold, you, know, you do play with the air slightly. It's just adjusting the mixture. But most of the time, you tend to have the air lever fully open for, for general running. Across on the other side, this is the ignition control. So advanced ignition towards you, retard it away from you. The starting tends to be the procedure is you advance it fully to where it comes to about here, retard it slightly, and that's about where you want to be for starting. General running, you'd normally be fully advanced on the ignition, although you know for slogging, going uphill slower, you may have to retard it off. It just slows the engine down effectively. Then on the top of the handlebar, we've got the clutch, um, which works, yeah, it's pivoted there, and it's yeah, just, a, just the same as a normal clutch, really. Then underneath, we have the valve lifter, which really only uses for, um, really only use that for starting and stopping, stopping the engine. It basically is, a, it lifts the, lifts the valve to, to uh, slightly lower the compression, really, is what it does, so that you can, you can start. So that's, uh, yeah, that's effectively your controls, and of course the horn. So this, um, this particular bike is a three-speed hand change gearbox, which means that obviously you change gear with your hand as opposed to the foot on, on everything that came after. Hand change kind of went out of vogue in the 1930s really. Um, foot change came in around about the mid, mid to late 20s but more for sporty bikes whereas a lot of people also preferred hand change because it was what there had been since the start of time really. So this one is the three speed hand, hand gear change. First, second and third. With first it's straight down then to come to second you come back through neutral although you don't go into neutral and then straight up into that notch there for second and then all the way up to the top for third so on this bike we have um, a combined fuel and oil tank the petrol's in this side and the oil is in this side which does mean that you have a limited range really um, it's about 70 miles to a tank full of petrol it's one of the problems with bikes of this age is that you you are struggling all the time for uh, for fuel after yes yeah, 60 miles you really need to be looking for petrol hence i carry this all the time which is um what we've yeah it takes away the anxiety from worrying all the time about running out of petrol in the old days when every town and village would have had petrol stations everywhere you would have been fine it wouldn't have been a concern when the bike was new but nowadays it's not so much the case so after 60 miles you're starting to get worried that you need to stop for petrol so <laughs> devise this system of carrying an extra extra bit of fuel which takes away an awful lot of anxiety although the sunbeam actually has a mechanical oil pump which is down on the front of the engine it at this point people were not completely trusting the mechanical pump so they like to have a hand pump which is, is this one so all you do with that push the plunger down which which forces more oil through the engine. The sight glass fills up, you can see the oil come up in there and you know from there that it's gonna drop down into the engine. Right, okay, so the starting procedure. First job is to switch on the petrol, which is on this side. Then there's a tickler on top of the carb. So we give it a good flood until we can see petrol coming up. Yep, so we're there. Right, then it's climb on board. So ignition wants to be fully advanced. Then we just knock it back a little bit. Air. It's always a little bit of a, a gamble to see, it depends on the conditions. It's now the sun's come out and it's lovely and shiny. So we'll try it, we'll try air about there. Then because we haven't got a twist grip, we've only got a lever for it. So we set the throttle to somewhere there. First thing, so clutch in just to make sure the clutch doesn't stick in. Then valve lifter, and at the same time as I kick it, I'll release the valve lifter. Right, now all that means is that it's over advanced. So what we do is we retard a tiny bit and we just do the same procedure. Still too advanced, a little bit more. We're still too advanced, a little bit more. And there we go. So then we just let it. Get the air open. A little bit less throttle. Start the throttle gently. What we do is 
in and out. And we're just call the ignition. Call the retarded, retarded. Lovely there. That is running nicely. Right, so here we are. We're just pulling away. We're in first gear. A few revs. And gently into second. So, you sh so we've got the lever throttles on the bottom. So I'm adjusting the lever all the time. So we're in second gear at the moment. Now we're just up into third. So lever back towards me into top. Now just hear the revs drop off a little bit. It settles down. So now we're ignition's fully advanced. So we're good to go, just check behind, there's nothing around us, all well, so now we'll just we'll gradually let our speed up a bit, gather the pace, air levers fully open, and we're just rattling along as you can see, so I don't, it's difficult, we haven't got a speedo, so I don't really know what speed we're doing, but my feeling was we're probably about 40, 40 miles an hour, 45 maybe, so we're just, uh, four, it's probably near to 40 to be honest, so we just kind of keep plodding on like this. There's a slight incline, so she's labouring a little bit. We just touch the ignition off, retard it a little bit, just to slow it down, slow the engine that down. So off we go, but we're now levelling out again, so we fully advance the ignition. A little bit more throttle, it's nice. We're just cruising along quite happily. So right at the front, we've got the forks. So you can really quite clearly see that these, these are effectively beefed up bicycle forks, they're known as girders. These are actually called a side spring, quite, quite evident why, just the springs on the side. Um, yeah, and so you have basically pivots pivots on here and here and so when you compress the forks that's removed the spring spring controls them quite a simple arrangement more links on the top as well right at the front is the front brake controlled from the from the handlebar obviously originally some beams were quite often had the, the front brake on the left hand side but this one's got it on the right thankfully 21 inch rims front and rear so they're the same size wheels same size tires front and rear the only rear suspension we've got is actually uh is this the sprung saddle again very similar to bicycles so the frame is completely Completely solid. There's no suspension anywhere. It's a, it's a, it's a brazed triangle at the rear. It's called an an open frame because the engine is in the middle. So the front down tube, back tube, cast cast bit here. So the engine is is in the middle. It is. It's so obviously just the bicycle with spread apart and then the engine put in. So where your bicycle crank would be would be somewhere here. And what we've got is a cast lug there. Yep. Triangle at the back, all solid, brazed, you know, brazed lugs here, or cast lugs, which the tubes are brazed into. Back brake, same as the front brake, um, they're called single leading shoe. They're actually not bad brakes for what it is. Um, the, yeah, the back brake in particular is reasonably good and they're not, they're not amazing, but they will, they will stop you. So see a little bit bumpy, so rigid rear end and the girder forks, but the girder forks do pretty good, you know, we're, we're on tire pressures about 20, 24, something around there, 22, 24. Um, so you know, you don't want the tires too hard because you know, that gives you some of the, the cushioning. So, yeah, so we're just running along quite nice, bumping around, and it's quite a spindly little bike, and you do need to keep a reasonable grip. That's where the steering damper. We just keep tweaking that every now and then, make sure that it's nicely nicely down keeps us nice and stable so my particular affection for sunbeams comes from really just the fact that they were one of the glamour models of the 1920s they were ever so expensive at the time this particular model was listed at 72 guineas sunbeam always did their pricing in guineas to uh, to distinguish them from the rest of the rest of the makers and yeah and there's always been a mystique and something about the sunbeam it's a fantastic name to start with the 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 makers didn't have anything to do with the name as in it wasn't their family name or anything but they just chose to use that and what a lovely name it is just as the sun comes out it seems very apt to to, to reference it. As well as making motorcycles, Sunbeam were high-end makers of push bikes as well. And one of the famous um, features of their push bikes was a fully enclosed rear chain. And they also used this on a lot of motorbikes, although not on this one. Being a slightly sporty model, they'd uh, left it off. The 
so this one, despite the fact it's fast approaching its 100th birthday, it's been used for quite a lot of runs and rallies over the four or five years that I've had it, and it's performed really quite well. It's uh, it's a lovely bike to ride on, on, on events. It just suits things, and it runs nicely, and it's quite easy, seems to start reasonably well, runs quite well, and it's just nice and light, manoeuvrable and good. I first came across this, this bike about 15 years ago. Um, I went to look at it local to where I was living at the time and somebody was advertising it for sale. And at that point I couldn't, couldn't afford it. And I lost, completely lost track of it until about five years ago, I responded to an advert for a bike that was for sale. And it just so happened to be the same one that I'd, uh, I'd not been able to buy 10 years before. So it's a, a strange coincidence, although the price had more than tripled by then and it was also 150 miles away, but we got there in the end.